for the South African Broadcasting Corporation as its economics editor. I often say that we carry one of the most noble and compelling mandates on the continent to educate, to entertain, to inform, and to play a role in de democracy and in development. We will be televising the session live as the SABC, as Africa's largest broadcaster, to 50 different African countries. Welcome. I will now introduce our guests and my esteemed panel. Your Excellency, President Mnangagwa of Zimbabwe, welcome to our country. You're a lawyer. <laughs> You're a former Minister of Justice, former Minister of Defense, former Minister of Rural and Housing and Social Amenities. You're also former Minister of Finance. You're well equipped to speak to this topic. We are also joined by one of Africa's most influential women. You come from Cairo. You're in the Cape now. You arrived at a time when we are mourning the death of a woman in this country, hence the demonstrations outside the World Economic Forum venue. Her name is Zinene Mkhwetyan. We honor her today. Your background is in electrical engineering, and you have worked for the United Nations, the African Development Bank, and so on and so forth. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. All the way from Europe, Danielle Stoffel Del Pret is a representative of the Swiss government and is State Secretary for International Finance. We will be discussing PPPs. Thanks for joining us. Jeffrey White, CEO of Agile, a very fashionable name at the moment, came and flew in from the Middle East. Thanks for joining us. Madam Wong Ai Ai is from Singapore. She comes from a region whose development path we are all envious of and could share many lessons that we would do well to take heed of. Welcome. Your Excellency, we come from a region, you and I, of uneven development and many infrastructure backlogs. What do you think the big mega projects can do to help us improve employment levels, more even development, and most importantly, how can we begin to collaborate? Well, we have to look at each country's background, the history of each country contributes to where we are in terms of uh, the level of development, uh, in terms of the acquisition of technology in our respective economies. But at the end of the day, history is the past. We now have to look into the future and to say what must we do for ourselves to improve the lives of our people into the future. In my view, speaking uh, about Southern Africa, SADC in particular, all the member states of SADC have different histories and the size of our economies are different. But it is necessary that we integrate, we talk to each other, we have conversation about how we move forward. It is necessary that uh, I should mention at this stage that the current crop of leadership in Southern Africa, SADC in particular, is now different from the founding fathers of SADC. The liberation leaders. Yes, because their task at the time they were seized 
with the task to liberate our region, that every single country in our region should be independent. So there was a political struggle to gain independence, freedom, and dignity of our people. But our current crop of leadership have a different task to achieve. It is now economic rather than political. Yes, political because we must deepen our democracy. That is political. But it is necessary that we now grow and modernize our economies. We must be able, as we develop individually, make our economies talk to each other, we have a conversation to each other. Now you are talking about major uh, projects in our respective countries. What comes to mind immediately is the major projects that are applicable to the region. Things like energy. We have a deficit of energy in the entire Sadiq area. So we must look at how we must collectively resolve the issue of energy in Southern Africa or in Sadiq in particular. That's number one, so that as we move forward, as we modernize energy or electricity is critical to achieve that objective. Then secondly, the issue of infrastructure. Some infrastructure is domestic, that is, it's national. Some infrastructure is regional. If you look at roads, we must have roads that speak to each other. We must have roads that are developed a standard that is acceptable to the entire region in our area. Let us look at our railway infrastructure. Our railway infrastructure was developed separately uh, during the colonial period, but now we must make sure our railway system and networks must speak to each other. We must modernize, we must have a vision as to what we must have in future in relation to our railway system uh, in our respective countries. I think something like uh, of the 15 or 16 uh, countries of Sadiq, I think 12 of them or so are landlocked. They have no access to the sea. Like yours, Mr. President. Yes, like in Zimbabwe. But we must not then bury our heads in the sand and say we are landlocked. We should say, initially, we believe we must say we are land-linked. And how do we get land-linked? We must develop uh, systems to take us to the sea. But down the line, as we cooperate uh, with countries which share uh, uh, the seas, like Mozambique, South Africa, Namibia, we become also sea-linked, because we've now developed infrastructure that can look after our goods and services in and out. But to do so, we must have a system where those countries who are landlocked, the cost of uh, their services in and out, goods and services, must, uh, we must find a way of lessening that burden so that uh, on average, our economy is going to be burdened by the reason that we are landlocked we must uh, be able to cooperate either by road, by rail, or by air. It is critically important that we do so. So I've talked about energy, uh, which is a deficit in our, in our area. We also now must look at uh, food security. It is critical that in developing countries like Africa, the primary thing we must secure is that as a region we must be food secure. Mm. Yes, we don't have the same um, endowments in regard to agriculture uh, in the region. But I believe that um, if we modernize and mechanize our agriculture and have a focus as to uh, where we want to reach in relation to making uh, our region food adequate, then we must cooperate in mechanizing our agriculture, in modernizing our agriculture, and having each member state doing the best depending on the um, uh, uh, advantages they have in terms of agriculture, wildlife, or livestock. That is another area. 
Then the next thing that follows is that we are also endowed with minerals, but not every member state of SADC has the same uh, number of minerals in the ground. But we should say that uh, in the past, when our founding fathers were concerned about uh, liberation and freedom, political freedom and democracy, we continued to exploit our um, resources and sent them out and processed without beneficiating our own uh, materials, our own uh, minerals. But now, under the current, uh, current uh, leadership, we are agreed uh, that it is necessary that we look at having technology brought into the region to beneficiate our minerals uh, together. At the end of the day, in the past, even the minerals, we had no capacity to be effective in the global market. It is also necessary now that as we develop, as Africa joins the global market, we also in our region must make sure we don't limit ourselves to the level of production, primary production. We must move forward to agro-processing and the beneficiation of our minerals in the country and then participate directly into global markets. This is what I believe we should do in our region. So our task uh, with the current leadership is that uh, we must continuously interrogate what we must do. In my view, we bring in the type of education that must now be in our region. In the past, we were taken to school 50 years ago, 60 years ago, in order to be able to be clerks or nurses. But we are not uh, given education to be innovative for our own needs to address the challenges which we face and by ourselves develop uh, technologies to attend to the particular uh, uh, um, challenges which we face as a region. So again, we are now talking to our higher institutions of learning to change the curriculums so that they address and they speak to the type of product we must produce in our institutions in order to develop ourselves. Yes, it is necessary. We cannot invent the wheel. But it is necessary that uh, as we look for technology from outside, we must have it adapted to our own conditions and also improve on it to adapt to our own conditions. I believe I've talked too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mr. President, you don't talk too much. <laughs> Madam Commissioner, the AU has a number of mega projects. Have these translated into um, increases in GDP in the various areas. What has been the impact of these projects? Uh, thank you very much and thank you for having me on this panel. But let me start uh, on maybe talk about what, what's happening on the continent and how do we perceive these uh, mega projects. Our aim at the African Union is to create one continent that is peaceful, prosperous and competing at the global level as His Excellency Mr. President just said. Now, to do that, and maybe I will focus on infrastructure because this is what, what I know best, or at least I'm trying to, uh, uh, to know. Uh, now, uh, infrastructure, why it's important? The African Union has launched, as you know, for instance, the, uh, the African Free Trade Area, uh, and it went into uh, uh, effectiveness last July. We're talking about a huge continent uh, made of uh, 55 countries. Uh, the population is 1.3 billion people increasing. Uh, uh, th this is a young and young and energetic and in need of employment. Uh, thing is, uh, India is, has almost the same size in terms of population, but it's one country. Now we're talking about 55 fragmented economies. The size of our economies are, is small and cannot absorb all this potential of young people and, the, and does not, cannot create uh, uh, this large number of employment that is needed. Some studies say, and hear me well, that Africa needs million jobs per month. Million jobs per month. This is why mega projects are important. We need to make sure that whatever we're going to do, we need this huge space, and that's why we created the African Free Trade Area. We need to trade among each other, but trade in what? 
trade in the roots of services, therefore uh, we need to industrialize, transform, and so on and so forth. Now, the African Union has created uh, uh, or has worked with the regional econom economic communities in selecting a number of regional and transcontinental projects in the fields of energy, of transport, of ICT, and uh, uh, when I say transport, that's road, railways, uh, uh, air, and maritime. Uh, I wanted to uh, highlight that since we are talking about trade, the cost of uh, uh, of transport uh, in the, uh, within the composition of our uh, the cost of export in, in on the continent 70 percent. So transport uh, accounts for 70 percent of the cost of export in Africa. It's 20 percent elsewhere. And every one percent increase in transport and telecommunication infrastructure on the continent translates into 3% increase in exports. That's why it's important we, uh, uh, we work on our infrastructure, especially that the infrastructure that we were left uh, uh, off with mainly goes from Africa to the former colonials, but not between African countries. So that's why our program focusing on linking and physically linking the continent together and integrating it. Which is what the president Exactly. Says and taking it, uh, uh, taking it further. We finished a 10-year uh, program and by which you know uh, thousands of uh, kilometers have, uh, have been extended and you're talking about the uh, uh, Cape to Cairo and not only by road but also fiber optics and it's actually done by a, by a southern African company that is you know, uh, working on the Cape to Cairo uh, uh, linkage, uh, uh, I mean I ICT linkage. So um, back, to, uh, back to the question. Uh, we will see the impact in terms of GDP, and we are already seeing you know, an, an improved uh, GDP on the continent. Many of our economies, we have at least. In West Africa. Uh, actually, uh, even in West Africa, we have five or six countries now that account among the fastest growing economies in the world. Uh, by, by all accounts and despite all the challenges we're having on the continent, as a continent, we're still having positive growth rates and this has been sustained for almost 20 years now. And resilience, not only the growth rate, but the resilience, despite the global shocks that the continent has been witnessing, we have overcome these uh, uh, shocks and we still continue to, uh, uh, to have these positive uh, GDPs. However, the challenge is the large number of jobs that are needed uh, on the continent. And the, the cost of infrastructure is big, it's huge. We're talking about the financial uh, needs between 100 and 130 billion by some estimates. And we can only provide a third maximum half of that as governments with, with the, all the competing demands the governments, our governments are having. And in addition to all of this, we are also facing a huge challenge of climate. And many of our infrastructure gets wiped away at the next storm. And we've seen this happening, especially in this part of the world, I mean, in Southern Africa. And the, and the shocks due to climate are happening in a much more vicious way and more frequently than before. And Africa, which is the less guilty when it comes to climate change, is paying the heaviest price. Madame Stoffel Delpret, Deloitte estimates that over the next 10 years, the Africa infrastructure backlog will need to be funded by the tune of about 93 billion per annum. Talk to us about funding. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. I come from a landlocked country as well. We know a thing or two about needing infrastructure to uh, have access to markets and to have uh, a growth perspective. Uh, but we, I also come from a country where we currently live with negative interest rates. If you as a company take out money from a bank, they pay you to take their money. On the other hand, if you as a pri an individual want to save your money and bring it to the bank, you have to pay the bank to take the money. So the huge amounts you just uh, cited that are needed in infrastructure, not just on this continent, but globally to also achieve the 
development goals that we have all set for ourselves. We need uh, to find a solution, not just to, to the financing, but we also need to find a solution to having the huge amounts of money that are available to bring them to the projects that need that financing. And we, as a financial market that is one of the, the largest in the world, and uh, Switzerland is known for having the largest uh, cross-border wealth management sector uh, within its borders, we are very interested in exactly addressing the interface between the money that is there and the need that is so apparent all over the world. And we try to do this in, uh, in, I would say at least in two, two paths that overlapped. One is we want to look at the interface and bring our expertise to the table in helping assess um, risks, credit risks, um, debt sustainability, for example. Our huge um, insurance industry has, uh, has a, a great part to play in that role. But we're also looking at questions of transparency and, of course, integrity of financial markets. They all need to play a role and they all need to be brought together by the partners in a, in a bankable project. And we are very much interested in finding maybe prototypes and working also with regional development banks in, uh, in finding exactly the right recipe of all the, the needs, as also Mr. President addressed them, to have money flow from where it is to where it is needed, also to the benefit of those who then invest. And I would say the second aspect that we're looking at is um, the the huge chances and the opportunities that are, are, that are opened, especially in the West already, by the new digital technologies. Switzerland has a regulatory framework that already addresses the challenges of the blockchain technology. And um, we see how market infrastructures, financial market infrastructures, trading platforms, investment opportunities, ad advising of customers with regards to investments is already done in a, on, a, on platforms, on systems that are um, easy to handle, that are very accessible, that offer a great degree of transparency and stability and security. And we would already want to bring that dimension also into, into the mix of helping uh, such projects come to fruition. Listening to you, one gets the sense of an exciting future for infrastructure because traditionally on our continent, infrastructure spending has been funded off the balance sheet of our states. And um, this is set to, to change now that, you, um, now that there are new technologies and new opportunities for cooperation across continents. And that's one of the beauties of this panel, is that it's a multi-continental exercise. Jeff White, what is your contribution to this? So I think, I mean, as a, a private and sec sector investor, and Agility is one of the world's largest logistics companies operating globally. And from an Africa perspective, I think we are hugely bullish on the African opportunity. A lot of our traditional markets we're seeing are slowing down or stagnating. We think Africa is the place to be investing and putting real capital into providing infrastructure solutions. Now, as a private company, we can't uh, do full infrastructure packages and sort everything. So we, we're investing in what we see is fundamentally infrastructure aligned with the growth opportunity. So we're building across the continent a network of international standard warehouse parks. Now, on the face of it, that doesn't seem particularly exciting, but the reality is the capability, the warehousing and, and buildings that are fundamental building blocks to economic growth and prosperity. So we use our, our warehouses, we invest, we put the capital in, we buy 500,000 square meters. That's about 100, 100 football pitches, to put it into perspective, on the edge of all the major cities in Africa. We build the infrastructure and we invest in it. So it creates a platform that enables trade. 
and we see it, and I think it aligns with everything everybody said, we see it as a way that manufacturers are able to have an ease of doing business and, and manufacture locally to, to meet demand. It's a logistics platform that will support regional trade and the growth uh, with the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, the growth of a market that's 1.3 billion, 2 billion people by the time it's actually up and, and operational. Uh, we think that e-commerce is going to be huge in Africa. So although building warehousing doesn't seem hugely important, the reality is it enables SMEs to grow and develop. Uh, an SME can come to us, and we've got examples in, in our current portfolio, where they couldn't raise the money to build premises to expand their operations and meet international standards. For us, they can come in under our SME program, sign a, a lease, pay a deposit, and get the keys and move in Monday. Likewise, when I look at our 65,000 global customers that we do integrated logistics for, they all want to go to Africa. They all understand the opportunity. They just find it really difficult to execute. So by building uh, uh, an infrastructure capability, a warehouse park, and it's landscaped and it's got consistent power, it's safe and it's secure, it, it enables companies to say, great, let's go into the Africa marketplace and it makes the ease of doing business more efficient and much simpler and faster. If I look at, at Ghana as an example, one of our large blue chip uh, customers, they had an original plan to go into Ghana that they thought would cost them $5 million investment to find a site, build a factory, set it up, start operating, and they thought it would be $5 million and three years before they sold any product. Because we'd already built and invested in the infrastructure, they were able to come into one of our warehouses, set up their manufacturing plant, so their cost of going into the African market moved from $5 million to $1 million for exactly the same business plan. And instead of selling products in three years' time, they were able to start selling products in three months. So that's a real enabler, and going back to your point, that's, that's a platform that can create jobs, can create jobs for local companies, can create jobs for multinationals coming into the, the um, continent. And I think, although we're doing it in a very niche sector, which is in relation to warehousing, the opportunity is, as infrastructure gets better, you can trade regionally, you can manufacture and move goods. Instead of just selling in, in uh, Abidjan and Cote d'Ivoire, you're able to sell across the whole of West Africa. And that's what's going to really stimulate the economic growth. Well, thank you for that very granular view from the ground. One I add, you come from a country that moved from being a third world country to a first world country at a dizzying speed. And your infrastructure is breathtaking and enviable. What lessons would you, would, would you like to share? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be part of this panel. And thank you for your kind words. I think it's easier for a country like Singapore, which is small, uh, to get from point A to point B uh, in, in uh, 54 years. We, we just turned 54 last month. Um, a little bit about myself and, and the organization I represent. Um, I'm from Baker McKenzie. I'm the Asia Pacific Chair. Uh, we are an, a global law firm, and we believe in following our clients. And I have to say, Africa has become extremely interesting. You, you're seeing interest not just from the Europeans, the Middle East, but increasingly from many countries in the Asia Pacific region. Um, much has been said about Chinese investments. There have been Korean ones. The Japanese have been here for a long time. Um, and, and India and, and Indonesia as well. Um, so initially, as with all countries, you, you build, you start on the infrastructure first. And that is de development finance funded initially, and then multilaterally through other countries in the region, if you can paint a story or, or you know, convince with a story that regional integration and connectivity benefits all in the end, um, you will get a multilateral intra-regional effort. And I think Singapore has piggybacked on that uh, to an organization called ASEAN, which is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, to have a louder voice on the global stage um, to, to get the, the funding and the attention that we needed. But infrastructure is just the beginning. 
And it's very interesting to hear from His Excellency and from Jeffrey um, and, and from uh, uh, Mina as well, the Commissioner, um, about you know, infrastructure being just the foundation stone, right? Because you're not really just looking at infrastructure per se. It's everything else that, that can build upon what infrastructure enables. Uh, things like trade, um, not just exports, but intra-regional uh, imports and, and trade as well, foreign direct investment, education, banking and finance, technology transfers. So, so I see, I see you know, Africa as being at the beginning of a very exciting story. And perhaps what I'd like to hear from this panel and maybe even the audience um, is much has been said about multilateral uh, governmental and uh, institutional effort, but there has been a lot of private sector investment into Africa as well, from all over the world, and they're all competing with each other. And uh, the FDI is growing by double digits across the continent. So, you know, it'd be interesting to see, um, apart from infrastructure, what, what the African Union and other countries are doing to get together to coordinate and enable their private sector investment. Because I think in the end, that is going to be the engine of growth. I think they'll have to answer whether the African private sector is growing and is it growing as fast as it, it should. But Mr. President, we need to tell a harmonious story and we need to work on social cohesion. Events in South Africa recently don't bode well for regional cooperation. What can we do to enhance social cohesion and unity in our region? ASEAN was able to tell one story. How can we? My um, own belief is that um, as we aspire to modernize and uh, remove our people from poverty level to middle income levels, we must address certain issues that are necessary to lift the lower strata of our societies, like in the area of housing, the area of clean water, the area of sanitation. These are basic and are local. I would believe that the five regions of our continent, uh, in our desire to modernize and so on, we should not forget that it is necessary that we don't leave anybody behind by making sure we address those issues that are domestic, that are at national level. But of course, in the long run, they will relate to the entire region when you have uh, clean water. You would not want your neighbor to be behind. Uh, you, you need also your neighbor to make sure they address that, sh that, that issue. They focus uh, on uh, making sure uh, the majority of our people have access to clean water, they have access to housing. Mr. President, if your brother, Cyril Ramaphosa, my president, were to ask you how to deal with xenophobia in the interests of economic cooperation, what would you say, sir? The issue is a question of understanding, a question of accepting each other. And that comes from how uh, our current governments relate to the people, our political parties. We must preach unity. We must preach love. We must preach that we are one people. We are brothers and sisters not only in one single country, but in the region. We must uh, talk about integration so that the mentality of this is mine and it ends there must be removed. We must move away from the past uh, concept of communities being separate. Currently, we are integrated. You have South Africans marrying in Mozambique, uh, Mozambicans marrying in Zimbabwe, Zimbabweans marrying in Botswana, uh, people from Botswana marrying Namibia, Zambia, and so on. We are getting integrated. So all what is necessary, those things that are happening are a, a result of uh, failure to bring people to a level where they uh, uh, 
respect each other. And that can only be done when people have a hope, when people can see that they can progress, when there is a roadmap for progress, a roadmap for moving from the lowest standard. You can see that, okay, two years ago, I was at this level. Now I'm that level. But if persons remain without hope, feeling depressed, it is easy for these things to happen. So it is my view that uh, uh, we should continuously uh, have a conversation with our people, giving them hope for moving forward and implementing such projects, such uh, 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 programs in society, which lifts the hopes of our people to go forward. I love uh, it. Love is about growth as well. Madam Commissioner, um, is Africa's private sector growing and is it as buoyant and ready for the challenges of cooperating with this, the governments of this continent and other um, private sectors um, in the challenge of addressing our um, infrastructure backlogs? Uh, yes, but not enough. Uh, you will draw across the continent, all our countries uh, without exception are conducting some form of uh, reform uh, in order to improve the investment climate, without exception. But a lot still needs to be done. Uh, and as I always say, I mean, the, I just mentioned the number of $130 billion needed for infrastructure alone. And of course, that's beyond any government to, uh, to carry. So unless all stakeholders are uh, uh, partnering uh, with the governments, we will, not, uh, we will not be able to address the challenge. The, the private sector increasingly in our countries is uh, uh, perceived as, uh, uh, as a viable partner. But as I said, it's not enough. We need to continue to improve uh, in terms of ease of business. Uh, 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 creating economies of scale to uh, provide, you know, an attractive, uh, 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 an attractive uh, uh, project, you know, for, for investment. Uh, continue uh, uh, to improve our regulatory frameworks, not only at the national, but also at the regional continental uh, uh, level, since we are talking about, uh, uh, about projects that very often you would be across border, and that's a role that the African Union is doing. So harmonizing the regulatory frameworks and the policies and the strategies is an essential part of uh, what we do. Uh, but there is also, I mean, all is not negative. We have uh, African initiatives such as Africa 50, which is by definition uh, a private sector uh, initiative or an initiative geared to attract the private sector, the African uh, uh, private sector to invest in Africa. We want our brothers and sisters, uh, uh, owners of businesses in, the, uh, in Africa, not to put their money in Switzerland with all due respect, but to put them and to invest them in, in, in the continent. So we, uh, we are looking also at uh, attracting and securing uh, 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 the investments of our brothers and sisters, Africans, to continue working uh, on the continent. And uh, uh, that said, we are also keen in attracting the foreign investment in order to, I mean, the private sector, the, the non-African private sector. In, this is also an opportunity for uh, uh, technology transfer, for improving uh, skills, for uh, uh, creating, you know, uh, uh, new ideas. And it's a, it's a dynamics we need to, uh, to continue working on. It's at this point that we need to open up to the floor um, but before we do, let's hear from you. I would ju would just wanted to echo the, the quest for openness. I live in a country where more than a quarter of its population is foreign, and uh, capital markets need to be open. Growth is definitely um, due to the, the, the quantity or the, the relative volume of, of openness, be it capital, be it uh, human resources, being other factors that need, are needed for production. And the, it is difficult, it is not easy, it puts every society in a, in a very demanding position. We see that in Europe as well. And I would only like to echo the strong call for openness in all these respects. Shall we have a broader discussion, please? Sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Ishan Darura, The Washington Post. 
thank you again for this panel. Uh, uh, His Excellency, the President of Zimbabwe, spoke of the need uh, to preach regional love and unity, to move beyond the politics of the past. But I would ask you, sir, um, what uh, love and unity have you showed for recent uh, protests of opposition in your own country? Um, what can you tell us about your country's progress from the politics of the past uh, two years after a, a very significant transition uh, and, and hopefully towards a more progressive and inclusive democracy? Yes, thank you very much for that question. From the day I came to office, my mantra was that we must be united. We want a united Zimbabwe, where everybody is accepted. We have preached the peace and unity in Zimbabwe. We have opened up for the last 20 years or so, Zimbabwe was isolated. It was a pariah state that we have opened. We have said we are going to engage and re-engage. Engage with those countries that had not engaged with Zimbabwe before. Re-engage with the, uh, Zimbabwe, with those countries that had disengaged with the Zimbabwe. For the first time, my brother, if you, uh, your memory can uh, uh, help you, the last general election we had in Zimbabwe was the first general election that we held where I opened global space for global media to witness our election, and it was very peaceful. We were surprised when, of course, uh, at the end of uh, uh, voting on the second day that there was uh, the, uh, um, demo the violent demonstrations that have happened. We are against that, and I believe that as we go forward, for instance, during the campaign period, I proposed that all the 55 political parties participating in our general election should sign commitment to peaceful elections, and we did so, and it happened. But not everybody will catch up with good things. Some remain behind. But we will do our best, my brother, that we should continue to preach peace and ask everybody that only when we are stable and we're working together in unity can we prosper. And we'll be respected by the international community if we show that we are democratic, we give democratic space to everybody in terms of constitution. We have one of the constitutions, I think, in our region, which is very, very democratic, and we, we, we respect it. However, the rule of law must be obeyed. The rule of law must take a root in our country. Not everybody observes that overnight. But as we go on, I have no doubt that as we move on, we shall continue to improve and deepen our democracy. Thank you, sir. I saw a hand on this side. Is that hand still up? Yes, sir. <coughs> news. Uh, just in terms of interregional um, progress, um, how are you aligning with NEPAD, uh, African Union? How is the coordination working? Who is the director? Again? I think to the commissioner. The <laughs> <laughs> um, NEPAD is, uh, is part of the African Union. So uh, the African Union is the, uh, the commission, the African Union commission uh, is the body, the political body, and in charge of uh, policies and strategies. And our executing arm is uh, is NEPAD, which is now turned into AUDA or African uh, uh, African Development Agency. So we, you're, we are one. <laughs> Uh, and as such, we develop together, uh, and the next meeting is going to be in November, by the way, uh, we developed together this continental, transcontinental regional uh, infrastructure project, uh, as I said, that has transport, energy, ICT, and tourism, by the way. Uh, and we get agreement uh, over these, and this has been a bottom-up uh, approach. So. Every region, every uh, community, uh, uh, regional economic community, 
south, east, north, uh, uh, they, they come up with, with the list of projects, the priority projects. So, uh, and they, we come together in November, we consolidate all these lists and we agree on the, on the priority for the, the, the priority projects for the next 10 years. And we take this uh, in January to the heads of state summit to endorse it and we, uh, we, we go for it. Uh, in terms of resources mobilization and working uh, to that. But that's only the physical part of it. Remember, the soft infrastructure is still a very big important uh, element, which is the harmonization part, which is how to work together, the improvement of the regulatory framework and so on and so forth. And I still insist on the improvement of the investment climate. At the end of the day, be it public money or private money, you want to make sure that it's well spent and that it has, you know, the returns we, uh, uh, we aspire. Would anybody else like to make use of the one or two minutes remaining for this discussion? Yes, sir. Um, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Wilford Mwanza. I'm part of the Global Shapers community. And my question is directed to uh, Ms. Stoffel Delpret. And the African youth are considered a critical stakeholder in these conversations. Uh, statistics say that about 75% of the population in Africa are youth below the age of 35. So this would mean that this would be an integral part where young people should, be, uh, play, should play an active role. So which areas or maybe how can young people be involved more in this conversation, specifically in what you said in bridging the gap between uh, um, linking the capital, excess capital that is looking for places to be invested together with the areas where they can be invested in? How can youth be more involved and what advice can you give to them? Thank you very much for this question. Um, I think um, I already touched upon a, a part of the answer I'm going to give you. Um, it's your generation that are the, the tech savvy. You are the ones who have to carry the continent into the next revolution, the next the digital revolution. And uh, you are our counterparts if we talk about uh, blockchain technology and how we could use it for international money transfers, for remittances, for uh, creating a stable coin or helping to create a stable coin that may uh, help in, in stabilizing uh, <clears throat> the system. So um, while having discussions here also in Cape Town, uh, it occurred to me and we discussed infrastructure while you mentioned the IT side of it all. Um, uh, I, I did mention that when we talk about mega, mega projects, they are great providers of jobs and, uh, and they help create jobs for youth. But I do not wish to, uh, to, for this to be understood that this is the only way youth is going to be involved in, in any project, mega project or otherwise. Remember, our youth are also providing us through the tech solutions uh, that were just mentioned with innovative ways of doing business, of doing these projects. And we have across the continent a wonderful number of initiatives that were initiated, thought of uh, by, by youth that provided us with ways of doing things that were not imaginable before. Think of the as, uh, energy uh, uh, to pay as you go, for instance. Uh, since uh, think of uh, mobile money, which is about financial inclusion across the continent. This has been, I mean, ideas that, yes, you're right, people of, of my generation did not think of because we continued to think in, in a much more conventional manner. But you are very much involved. You're doing a lot o uh, uh, already, and this should not by any means be uh, uh, overlooked. I'm thinking of the South African invention, Please Call Me, by a young man called Ngosana Makate. Mr. President, Your Excellency, thank you very much. Thank you. Shukran. Thank you. Siabonga. Siabonga. And as we say in this part of the world, Ngoska Kulu.